Hi, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit behind the scenes of a project that I recently completed this past December that's called Leo the Maker Prince. Um, here on this slide is just a, a little bit of um, the my Twitter handle. And there's Leo has a Twitter handle, even though he's just a robot. Um, and the website for the book is www.leothemakerprints.com in case you wanted to check it out while I was talking. And um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the project, uh, it, Leo the Maker Prints is a children's book aimed at kids around say 7 to 11 or 12. And it teaches kids what 3D printing is about through a story about a young woman named Carla, um, so it's a little autobiographical, and a robot named Leo. And the robot happens to be a 3D printer. So he explains to her how he works and shows her the magic of 3D printing. And then throughout the book, there is a series of objects that are either characters or some of the objects that um, come up through the story. I'm going to go through those. And all the objects that are pictured in the book can be downloaded and 3D printed. So not only is the project a book, but as a professional designer, I took a lot of time with a team to actually design the objects so that they were appropriate for 3D printing as well as fit in within the storyline. And um, Yasmina gave you a little bit of background, uh, but just uh, to let you know why I was doing this project and how it inspired me. Um, I've been a professional designer more recently in the last six years with a firm called Smart Design that's designed many things that we have in our homes, um, a lot of kitchen appliances. My focus has always been on physical things that have some kind of digital or interactive components. Um, and in the process of designing things, we've always used 3D printing as part of the process. Um, one of the projects that I've worked on is for a company called Neato Robotics. In, uh, they're actually in the Bay Area in the U.S. And um, yeah, I worked on a lot of the interaction. And then the industrial designers I worked with did a lot of 3D printing. Um, and uh, Irina also explained that I run a group called the Smart Interaction Lab, which is all about experimenting. So I'm a big proponent of taking new technologies and pushing them and seeing where you can go with them. Um, in my work with the Georgia Tech Socially, Machine, Socially Intelligent Machines Lab, I designed the shells for a number of robots. Um, one is named Simon, which you see pictured here. And Simon is an upper torso humanoid robot um, meant for research to study how we might be able to interact really naturally with machines. So it was really important that the robot be friendly and approachable, but not look too much like a creature or too creepy, like still look like a machine. So I spend a lot of my professional life, this is another robot that, um, whose head shells I designed that's named Curie that was just done um, in the past year. And um, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about why the shape of things really matters and how we might um, interact with physical objects. So that's why 3D printing has been really exciting to me. And um, in these next few slides, you can see a little bit of the process for the robot design. Here is a scaled down version. So it's a half scale. We've also did quarter scale, and we did a lot of iterations this way. But what was interesting to me is when I did a lot of this work, and a lot of the work I did with smart design, we were using really, really expensive 3D printers. Um, you know, sometimes they were $50,000 or more machines. And um, here are the, the final robot shells. The final robots are actually also 3D printed. Um, but you know, these were very high-end projects at special research institutions. Um, so when the DIY movement was happening with 3D printing, and desktop 3D printing started becoming a reality, I felt like it was a very, very important moment in time. And here on the screen you see um, Make Magazine every year published, has been publishing a review of all the desktop 3D printers. And you can see the prices range from you know, as, as little as less than $500 for certain kits 
um, you know, to two or three thousand dollars, the price of a laptop. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do? Maybe an article, or I think I want to do a book. And when I really thought about it, I felt like, you know what? This is going to affect people. Kids in the future are going to think of things to do with this technology that we as adults are not capable of comprehending. So wouldn't it be great to put this in the hands of tomorrow's uh, makers? and designers and actually get you know share with them why I love design and why I've loved using 3D printing as a tool in my work. So I created a story and I assembled a team. I hired a story editor whose name is Cindy Hansen and she works a lot with children's theater. I um, had an apprentice who um, was working with me who's a young product design student named Alexa Forney. I hired a professional photographer because I knew that photographing these objects would be really critical. And I also worked with a book designer. And um, as you can see here, so he here are some of the characters that are in the book. And um, then the story is actually told also in illustration. So everything is an illustration until the moment that an object that can be 3D printed appears. Um, and in terms of the story, just to go over it really quickly, you know, this is Carla, and she uh, actually falls off her bicycle during a hurricane and meets Leo. And Leo explains that he has a spool of filament on his back, and he has a neat heated nozzle that is at the end of a tail, and then he has a tray that he can put on his head that can be the build platform. So you know, what he actually does is he will hold that tray above his head and then will 3D print. And he asks Carla to uh, draw me a sheep. And for those of you who are familiar with the little prints, you'll see that this is my loving nod to Antoine de saint Exupery because um, it's a book that I loved as a kid, and I just – I just thought I, I wanted to really kind of honor that. And it's amazing to me that something that I had as a child is still on my shelf and still something that I cherish. That's another reason why I really wanted to do a project like this. So in the book, Carla draws the sheep reluctantly because she didn't think she could do anything creative. And then um, Leo actually builds the sheep as a 3D object. Um, so uh, you know, four pools of plastic appear, and she says, sheep feet. Um, and then as you can see in this uh, little animation, this is one of the illustrations from the book that goes across a spread of two pages. And then on the next page, we see the sheep. And um, you know what's been completely fascinating about this is it's uh, you know Dale Doherty, the um, CEO of Make, had said to me, you know, this is, it's a fictional story, but it's also kind of a real story. And it is in many, many ways. Um, because not only is it uh, very real in terms of a lot of how I feel about things, but, um, you know, I have this fictional sheep, but then because people can download it, it becomes a real sheep out in the world. And I'm now starting to get pictures um, from people, and maybe some of you, of uh, people who have made the sheep, or have made the Leo character, or have made the jewelry. Um, so, uh, you know, this is one of the things that's so exciting about 3D printing, about your file existing as something digital. So, I wanted to share a little bit of behind the scenes. First, I'm going to go through the objects that are in the book, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the process for developing those objects. Um, so the first character, and the objects are told, you know, Leo, he's a robot, and he actually has like a lot of robot friends, right? So um, he has robot friends that are in different neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And this one is Mark V, and he works with an inventor. Um, and the inventor's name is Brendan, which is actually also an homage to a friend of mine named Brendan Dawes. And, um, you know, what was uh, really interesting to me in terms of crafting the story, so, which was also kind of a new thing for me. I've never done a book and I've never done a children's book. Um, but I built these scenarios to explore possible futures for 3D printing. And I started out with the most, um, the most mundane in a way, and this is the way we've been using 3D printing for many years, is as a prototyping tool. So Brendan um, creates this, I call him the news dog, and it's actually a robot, and it has a thermal printer, um, which you can buy from any online kind of real retailers like Adafruit or SparkFun here in the US. Um, 
And the thermal printer has a Wi-Fi card in it and can connect to the Internet and print out news just about a specific topic. So this one is printing out news about robots. Um, and the shell is 3D printed. And the next scenario we have Stephanie. And Stephanie's a jewelry designer. And her scenario is the micro, what I call the micro factory. So you know, we can imagine that jewelry designers would be able to print out their designs from maybe even a machine in their studios. You know, right now, a lot of jewelry designers are using a service like Shapeways. Um, you know, and Stephanie uses math, so we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, the next scenario is you know, we always envision, well, what if we had 3D printers in every home? So here we have Alexa, and Alexa has a robot called Sinclair 10 another friend of Leo's. And Alexa's mom says, um, you can download some toys today, which is also another interesting question. Like, If you could have toys every single day from your 3D printer, would your parents allow you to? But that's kind of an aside. Um, so uh, Alexa downloads these um, musical instruments. And here I was also trying to experiment with a lot of different processes throughout the book. So the thing, the object that you see on the right is a, um, a shaker that you shake in order to you know, um, go along with drums or percussion instrument. And um, I used a process called throw-ins, where you stop the printer, and then you, you print the object as a shell a hollow shell, and then you can stop the printer, and you can put things inside of it. So in this print, we put rice inside of it, and then we allowed the print to finish. And we changed the filament for each color. So I was able to calculate how, what a third and a third and a third would be, and then calculate the size of the band and change the print. Um, and then on the left is, uh, we're calling it a rubber band guitar. It is um, inspired by um, an instrument that's called a cantella. It's kind of this handheld guitar. And we, um, in most, I tried to have everything be purely, purely 3D printed, but this was one exception where we used another object, which is a rubber band. Um, but uh, there are these little pegs at the bottom of the instrument, and those can be flipped open that will allow you to pull the rubber band. And when they flip close, you can close it. And I took inspiration. I was actually taking sailing lessons, and there are, um, there's something called a cam cleat that is a, a, mechanical, um, a mechanical fixture that you use to hold the ropes. So I took inspiration from a lot of places. Um, the next object that appears in the book is a ceramic. So I really wanted to, again, explore a lot of different materials and not just have it be plastic, um, PLA or ABS, like what comes off of a MakerBot. Um, so I have a character. His name is George, and he's new to town, and he wants to design some things um, that, go, that personalize his home. So he designed this, which is a planter that can also hang on a cabinet handle. So he can change all the kitchen cabinet handles, and they're now handles that double as planters that can grow microgreens. And what he does is he goes to visit a store, much like a Kinko's or a Staples, and this is a scenario where we would have um, 3D printing at any corner store, which is we know is already starting to happen. Um, and then the next scenario, we have uh, a young boy. So these are some of the process shots for um, forms that we looked at for uh, the planter. But here we have Nathan, and Nathan lives up by the beach, and he works with a robot called Iris 7, and Iris 7 has scanners as well as a printer inside. And um, for this one, you know, I also I wanted to make sure to show the um, scanning and customization aspect of 3D printing, which I think is really an important aspect of what 3D printing affords that we never had before. Um, so in this one, I actually scanned a foot and had a 3D model of a foot, and I used that as the negative space to cut out of the sandal. And then um, we also, uh, I, I drew um, a cartoon sort of version of an octopus foot um, and the idea behind this story is that he loves the beach, and if he leaves octopus footprints everywhere, um, his friends can find him. And then his friends liked it so much that they wanted um, other shoes that had their footprint. And the next scenario, and this is where we start getting 
more into the future is food 3D printing. So these are um, meant to be cheese, um, white and yellow and cheddar cheese. Uh, and our character here is named Emily, which is also inspired by a friend of mine who um, works with food. And uh, in this scenario, she creates a special dish, which is um, chess that you can play. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then the final object that shows up in the book is actually um, a hamster house. And I had read an article about how we would be able to use 3D printers on the moon, um, capitalizing on the lunar dust that shows up. So this is, um, this is a bit of taking that as inspiration. And you know, if a family had to move to the moon because the mom was an architect, what might the child make with it? Um, so uh, what I really wanted to share with you guys today um, is what's happened, you know, what happened as I was developing the objects. Oh, and also these next few slides are just to share a little bit of what's been most fun about this, which is here are sheep that people all over the world have made. Um, and then we have a few Carla characters. And what's interesting is that people will change things subtly. So um, on this slide, I was really waiting for this day, and it happened. I was waiting for the day that somebody made the black sheep because I knew it would happen. And that was really fun. And you know, every day I keep seeing new sheep and new versions of Carla's dress and new little versions of Leo. And um, I've even started seeing some fan fiction. So there's a fellow in Virginia who um, teaches workshops in 3D printing. And he'll sometimes write these little stories. Like here we have Leo, who is supervising a new colored dress for Carla. And here he's supervising, like, what if her dress could also be a scanner, which is kind of weird and interesting and, and all wrapped up in one. And um, he even wrote a story that uh, Leo can not only print in plastic, but he can also print in snow. Um, so that's a lot of fun. But the main thing I want to talk to you about is behind the scenes. Um, those of you who do 3D printing might recognize this image. There was a lot of this. <laughs> this is what happens when a 3D printer goes wrong. And you come back and you see spaghetti. So um, it was quite a long and frustrating process. I spent about three months working full time, three days a week with an assistant, um, working on, you know, and the bulk of the work was around the objects. And um, I used an Affinia printer for most of. My objects, I also used a MakerBot. Uh, you know, there were many days that the Affinia was broken, and then I had to use another one, and um, I had access to a Dimension U print. So um, it, it kind of verified that what I was doing was at least pioneering territory, because it was certainly not easy. Um, but um, I will share with you some of that development process. So you know, the, first, the first one was the sheep. And for the sheep, I kind of knew, well, first of all, with all of the objects, I really wanted to make sure I was designing with the 3D printing process in mind. So uh, you'll notice that a lot of the forms are fatter at the bottom and thinner at the top. And that's sort of to take advantage of the fact that if you have a stable bottom, it's a lot easier to grow things and grow things without support. Um, and uh, you know, and I also just as in terms of a designer, in terms of style, I really like things that are fairly minimal. Um, but on this next page, you can see some of the sketches. Alexa and I did a brainstorm of you know what might be interesting things and how might we kind of expose what 3D printing can do. For a while, we were thinking we might have an algorithmic structure or we might have holes that would be the body of it. But you know, I settled on this really bubbly one, and people really seem to love the sheep. And you know, in terms of the tools I use, I get this question a lot. Um, I use a program called Rhino, Rhino 3D, um, for a number of reasons. It's something I've been using for years to do product design and product um, modeling and a little bit of rendering. So I was very familiar with it. I find that it's pretty easy to pick up. The Mac version's been in beta for, for I think, almost seven years. Um, and it works really well. Uh, so I've been using that, and um, it's really gr a great visual tool for being able to do 
3D files. And it also has a lot of plugins, which we'll see when I talk about the jewelry. Um, so then in this next image, you can see, oh, let me kind of forward through these. Um, I apologize, I've been jumping. So in this next image, this is, uh, this is the very first sheep. So the first sheep I just printed as one piece. So you see the legs, and then you see the supports, and you see the fill in there. Um, so this is a white sheep with white legs, which is not how it appears in the book. Uh, but this was the first print. And then what I wound up doing is I wound up taking the legs and making them longer and taking the nose and the ears. And those are actually separate parts. And so what I do is I take them and I subtract them using a Boolean operation, for those of you familiar with the 3D software. And I subtract them from the main body of the sheep. Um, and then I grow those as separate parts. Um, and the next design I wanted to talk about was the Leo character. So for the Leo character, it was really important um, that his body was actually the thing that told the story. So this next image is I call Leo's Anatomy. This is inspired. I have this. I have these geeky Star Wars books. I don't know if any of you out there have them, but. Um, where the robots appear as these diagrams. And I really wanted to do this, but we wound up cutting it out of the book. But um, you know, this sort of explains that he's got a scanner in his eyes, and he's got this articulated tail, and he has a heated nozzle, and he's got this tray. And, um, and we're really looking at the robot. He had to tell the story of how 3D printing works, which is the thing that seems most mysterious to many people. So in this slide, we see some of the exploration um, that I did with my team, you know, and again, we talked about, and so, you know, maybe maybe it's it comes off his tail and it prints out on his tongue, which is what you see in the middle of this slide, or, you know, should the filament be on his head, or is the tray on the bottom? Um, and what we wound up really, you know, there's one you can see uh, on the left of the screen. Should the tray be on one arm, and then the filament comes out of another arm? And we wound up um, settling on you. Know, I really focused on this idea of gesture and the idea of the relationship between the person and the robot. So um, the fact that uh, you'd be able to look at Leo and he would hold this tray up and you and then and then he, what he could do is he could sort of present the print to you on the tray. Um, so that was I'm really happy with the way that thinking went. And um, you know the other thing is I really wanted these to be playful um, entities. So. Um, what we have here, I don't know if this is showing up in the audience view yet. Um, uh, let's see. The next view that I'm showing you is, uh, it says movable parts. And I think perhaps this hasn't, OK, there we go. Um, so in this one, this shows a little bit um, about how uh, Leo is broken up into parts. So for me also, it was important not just to have these characters kind of as these like static figurines, but I wanted to show um, some movement. I wanted them to feel like really cool little toys. Um, and so uh, what I spent a lot of time on is in um, this next slide, which is says robust joinery, and um, what I got to really perfecting was the press fit, and this is one of the things that um, has helped me. Like I actually I watch a lot of little kids with the Leo character, and they're they're sometimes very rough, and um, the um, the uh, what I needed to do was to uh, make them so that you could push them in, but also so that once they were in, they would lock in. So um, what I did here is you can see there's a little slot 
in the pin that goes into the negative space of the robot body. And that allows it to kind of compress just a little bit. And then um, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, there is um, a little notch where the fatter part of the pin can kind of spread out and fit in there. So, um, and I wanted to apologize to you all. I realized I was jumping around on my thumbnails, but I think it did, wasn't updating on your end. But I have it sorted out now. Um, so the next one I wanted to talk about was uh, Stephanie's jewelry. And so it was very important to me to, um, to do this idea of the micro factory. And um, you know, I also wanted to talk about math and using algorithms to generate form because this is something that I'm I'm kind of I kind of explored a little bit when I was in design school and something I'm really interested in. And um, I also wanted to have a female character that loved math. Um, so I decided that this jewelry, Stephanie's jewelry, was going to be based on math. But that's kind of all I knew when I began the design process. So I actually pulled out some old books that I had. I have a book that I really love. It's called Mathographics. It's all one word. And, um, and it gives me formulas. And I used to use it just to make kind of patterns on the screen. And um, it was exciting when I realized I could pull that book back out and look at some of the formulas and experiment with them. So I pulled that out and then um, you know, I started searching around when it comes to Rhino. So here's some of the formulas um, for a spiral that I was able to um, uncover. And I read a lot about Nicole Fermat spiral and of course the Fibonacci sequence, which you can use as a number to kind of feed the spiral in terms of how it's going to spread open. And I um, looked into, you know, how, what kind of software I could use. Um, a lot of designers like using something called Grasshopper, which is a visual interface for Rhino. Um, but I, uh, but it only works on the PC. Um, but I noticed that there's something called Rhino Python, which works on the Mac. So that's what I wound up using, and I really dove into exploring Rhino Python. And so this is a, this slide shows um, a little bit of uh, some script. In this one, I don't have the Fibonacci sequence the way we used it, but um, I think uh, you kind of get the point. This is how I was building the spiral. And what you can do is you do a text file. And then in Rhino, you actually have a command that lets you open the Rhino, the Python script. Um, and then you can feed it something like, um, at the bottom of this, um, you see uh, it says scale object. Um, so what I have it doing here is I have it allowing you to select an object. And then it will take that. So I, I just draw a cylinder. I select the cylinder on the screen. And then um, so at the top of this, it says select object, get object, select object. And then what's happening is it's taking that cylinder and it's replicating it and it's moving it in x, y, and z space based on my formula. And then it's also scaling it based on my formula. And um, on this, uh, so in this slide, this is one of the first spirals that I had. So you can see that there are cylinders there. And in this one, they weren't connected. And they were really, really, really skinny. This would make a lot of really of points that would be actually pretty difficult to um, 3D print. But uh, when I saw that I could get a form like this, I knew that I was on my way. And it was really exciting because you know this was starting to create kind of a cup with the spiral. and um, it was really creating some interesting patterns. So I kept playing around with the numbers in the um, Python script until I wound up with um, what you see here, where the cylinders, but it's essentially the same thing as the slide I just showed you. Only here the cylinders are fat enough that I was able to have them on the, on the screen and then um, have them next to one another so that they were overlapping just a little bit. And then I use a Boolean addition union 
so that they actually sort of fuse together and it all becomes one form. And then I use this form for earrings and I use it for a ring. I built a ring around it. Um, but that was really exciting. Um, and then, you know, another project I spent a lot of time on was the food aspect of it because I just felt like, ah, you know, this is going to be an interesting thing in the future. I mean, I don't really know how people are going to use it, but it's going to be something in the future. So what I did was I contacted a laboratory um, that's at Cornell University, and they're called the Cornell Creative Machines Lab, and they're run by a fellow named Hod, um, Hod Lipson. And um, the fellow that I worked with is a PhD student there who runs a lot of the food stuff. And his name, and it's very confusing because we have Hod Lipson, but his name is Jeffrey Lipton, as in Lipton T. And so I emailed them and I said, oh, let's see, you know, maybe I can hire them with a little budget. And um, I hired them as part of the research process for the book. And uh, this slide that you see is some of the experiments that take place at the Cornell Creative Machines Lab. And we have an octopus made out of, I think it's essentially corn flour. And then we have these sort of like cakes that have 3D um, letters inside of them. There is a space shuttle made of scallops, a kid not, um, and a block of turkey meat. Yes, yes, turkey meat. Um, there is a cheese with a uh, um, space shuttle on the bottom right there, and of course chocolate, which we see a lot of. Um, but I was very excited and they agreed to work with me. And what I did is I ran a series of brainstorms um, and also just a lot of questions to really understand what the technology of 3D printed food might be like. And so in the brainstorm we thought of a lot of things. We, we kept thinking of modular things like could you have Legos that were different flavors or do we want like sort of um, pasta. We talked about pasta a lot or um, do we want to have a necklace that you can chew off? Uh, we kept getting enamored with the idea of the moon because there's always this thing about the moon being made out of cheese. Um, but we wound up settling on the idea of chess pieces because chess pieces allow you, I mean they allowed us to sort of think of this whole story of um, the chess pieces plus crackers. And we have uh, some early photographs that actually have crackers. But in this one, we wound up um, drawing the crackers. In the end product in the book, we, we drew the crackers. Um, and the cheese was being FedEx to me. Um, but these are actually plastic pieces that are meant to look like cheese. Um, but I did have some cheese pieces. And uh, what I did was I, I got a lot of um, schooling from the folks at Cornell University. And we did a lot of back and forth where I sent them files of the 3D forms. And what they explained to me was that when 3D printing food, it has to be uh, what they called 2 and a half d So it couldn't have any overhangs at all. So um, these forms may look a little abstract for um, chess. And on Thingiverse, I have an entire chess set that you can print out. Um, but what I was really focusing on would be forms that would print out in cheese perfectly. So um, none of them have overhangs. They're all sort of fatter at the bottom and skinnier at the top. Um, but yet we have a differ differentiation between castles and pawns and kings and queens and rooks and that kind of thing. Um, so that was a really interesting learning experience for me. Um, you know, the next thing that was really interesting was I spent a lot of time on the title. I kind of knew that the title would have to be something 3D printed. So, um, you know, I just began 3D printing a lot of typography. Um, uh, a little fact, Leo's original name was Roger. Um, somehow uh, I thought it sounded like a robot's name and we say Roger that and all that. But then I realized that it wasn't as cool a name as I would um, like. I hope there are not a lot of Rogers out there. It's a very cool name, but it didn't seem to fit our robot. And we decided on Leo 
because it references Leonardo da Vinci, and we really wanted to get across this idea of math and science and art and creativity all being part of the same um, thought process. So, uh, you know, we began with the ordinary thing that you would do is you might take a letter and you might extrude it up so that it becomes a three-dimensional letter that all has the same thickness. Um, and, you know, then we looked at another sort of version. Here we also have some block letters that were grown in a maker bot. And we have the maker prints part that's a little irregular. Um, what I really wanted to do was push the irregularity. So on this next one, this is where uh, what I insisted on doing is taking the letters and really um, putting a kind of a taper on the bottom of them. So could they be fatter on the bottom or do twisting? So I have a number of experiments where we're twisting the letters and seeing what those look like. And um, I started really liking this fatter at the bottom. These ones that you're looking at here, they're, it's a little subtle, but they are fatter at the bottom and thinner at the top. And um, in this next one, um, you know, this is really, we were starting to print some of our fat at the bottom and thin at the top letters. And as we were printing, um, the printer, uh, the filament got stuck, as often happens, for those of you who use 3D printers. And um, it kind of stopped at this part of the process, or a little bit higher than this. And um, I stopped with Alexa, and we looked at this, and we showed it to a few folks who were nearby in our studio. And we said, this kind of looks really cool. And I thought, Could it, maybe, we, maybe we need to experiment even more than we thought. And what I wound up doing was actually printing these tapered letters that started out the way um, you see this previous one, where they're kind of super perfect at the top. But instead of letting the print get to the super perfect part, we stopped it midway through. And what we wound up with was um, what you see here. And we did a couple of experiments when it had the fill in it, because the fill is also just really interesting, right, visually. Um, so some of it had the fill in it. And then, and then I thought the fill was starting to become a little too much. Um, so this is what we wound up settling on. And I was really thrilled with this. And this is what the um, front cover of the book looks like. Uh, and what's very interesting to me is a lot of people ask me, what font is that? And it's really not a font. It's what happens when you take a really normal looking font, which was Euro style, and you taper it, and then you stop the printer halfway in between, um, which I never would have come to as a designer unless I was experimenting. So it was really a testament to the importance of trying things out. Um, and I even use this now. So this is the logo for the project, which is directly taken from the letter forms that came off of that halfway stopped in between um, 3D print. Uh, the, le the next process I wanted to talk about was the hamster house. And the hamster house is um, fairly intense. Um, you know, for one thing, I knew that I wanted it to be uh, a real something that a real hamster could live in. So it was going to be full size. So the size was always a challenge. Um, and I knew that we would want to look in there. So I wound up using a service called iMaterialize. Um, and iMaterialize will do a polished uh, plastic, clear plastic. I think it's, um, and that was sort of tricky to find, because I had actually bought some clear filament myself but the clear filament was, comes out cloudy if you don't polish it. So I was really thrilled that iMaterialize can print this. I have on my files for this, I actually have sort of a warning that this is a very difficult print to do. And it's very, very hard to do the clear printing, um, you know, unless anybody has other suggestions for me. But iMaterialize does a beautiful job. And these are from that service. Um, uh, but to take a step back, uh, as a professional designer, I really know that one of the kind of core principles that we work with is that it's really important to understand your user. Usually we're talking about people, but in this case we were talking about a hamster. So, you know, we began the process and Alexa and I were sketching a lot and I said, you know, we really need to understand hamster needs. 
we cannot design a hamster house without really understanding what a hamster needs. And um, you know, we went to the pet store, and I said, we have to find somebody who has a hamster. And then Alexa said, my roommate and I really want a pet, and we would really love a hamster. We'd take really great care of it. So we adopted Weenie, and um, Alexa took Weenie home with her, and, and Weenie still lives with Alexa and her roommate. And um, this is a picture of Weenie. And we studied what Weenie needs. We researched um, what animal experts say that hamsters need. And we also did you know, what we call in the design world as a competitive analysis, which means looking at other products that are out there on the market. So we really scoured the landscape of what's out there. And what we found that was best was the OVO, uh, which is by Habitrail. Um, so we looked a little bit at that, and we were inspired by that. And then the other thing is I, you know, I, always, I take inspiration from everywhere, everything that I see, which is one of the things I really love about being a designer. So I was also really kind of inspired by this house from the film Oblivion that um, has um, Tom Cruise in it. And it was this kind of floating, transparent house. And, um, and there was this like bubble craft that would land on it. So uh, a lot of my early sketches were inspired by that. So this is really inspired by the Oblivion House. And I was kind of thinking about this ribbon that would run all the way around the um, top and bottom of the house. And then inside it would be kind of clear. And um, you know, when we wound up sketching, we wound up thinking more about these bubbles. So at the top, the sketch in the center, that was a little closer to what we wound up really thinking about. Well, could we have these sort of like bubble chambers with a ribbon around the edge and they might connect and maybe you could have two, or maybe you could have three, and maybe they would be vertical, maybe they would be horizontal. And um, so we knew we wanted this modular system and then people could, you know, which was also inspired by the, the OVO um, because this um, OVO system has these connecting parts, and you can add or subtract as you need them. So that's what we were thinking about. And um, you know, what I did next was I went to Home Depot, and then really, and then just also looked around the house. I looked at the top of the blender, how the blender connects to the blender base. Um, these are some PVC pipe fittings. So just studying like how did those things go together. Um, you know, it's it's. You never really have to start from scratch. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I took a little inspiration from things like this. And then we did a lot of 3D printing experiments to look at how we could have this, um, you know, something that would go around the lip of the house and keep that bubble together. So we'd have the bubble split into two. So this next slide kind of shows you these are scaled down, really smaller models. But this shows you a little bit of what the hamster house looks like, what one module looks like. So you can attach it on the left or the right. Um, and these little um, connectors that you saw on the previous slide would actually hold the top and the bottom together. And um, there would be holes, and then you could you would have a lot of variation. So you could either put like a tunnel on the top of one, or you could put another um, another tube on the top of another. And um, on this next slide here, we have the uh, weenie. It's actually our star in the hamster house. So. Um, and these prints were actually printed, to be honest, this is a quite expensive hamster house. But um, I did want to push the future possibilities of 3D printing. So um, there's a hollow tube. Uh, there is a ladder tube. Um, then there are these end caps that can either close the bubble or they can be rings that allow you to attach another U-tube or allow you to attach another capsule. So it's a fully modular system. Um, and uh, so those are some of the things I wanted to share with you. And that um, was a little bit of behind the scenes of the project.